I do acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay tribute to their history, their culture and their ongoing struggles for justice. We stand today united with a very clear demand for the Modi government to back off, to get out of Kashmir immediately, and the priority must be restoring communication. I've lived in Australia all my life. I have three children and five grandchildren. I speak to them nearly every day. The thought that you could not do that, I just find so upsetting and so shocking. It must be so painful for you not to know what is happening to your family. I saw the footage from the BBC where we now know that the Kashmiris are on the streets of Srinagar. And we heard the noise we were told about the tear gas the pallet guns are again being fired at the people of Kashmir. Chef, and you can't find because at the moment they have been robbed for their voice. I did want to extend to you apologies from David Shoebridge, a Greens MP in the New South Wales Parliament. He couldn't be here today, but what he has asked me to extend to you is an invitation to hold a forum in Parliament where your representatives can come along and we can invite as many people as possible because we know that our work does not end today. We need to be a voice for Kashmir and to bring more people in to standing up to what the Indian government is doing. The reality, as you know, that the Kashmiris face, it hasn't happened just since the 5th of August. Thousands of people have died over decades. 70,000 people is what I read about, killed. And then there's the people tortured, maimed and raped. And I did want to speak about the gendered aspects of this war. The, the burden on the women of Kashmir is so extreme. When I was there last year, exactly a year ago, I heard a term that I had never heard before, half widows. And I asked what it meant. And they explained that so many Kashmiri men have disappeared, either killed or sent to jails that they, and their wives. They're not divorced, they're not widows, but they're carrying the burden of their family, the burden to look after and hold the family together, to be able to raise uh, you know, sufficient income so they can survive. I mean, just the most shocking conditions. When I was in the refugee camps, the stories I heard were deeply, deeply troubling. There is good news in the, in the past few days because the awareness about the crimes against humanity being committed in Kashmir by the Indian troops is getting to a wider audience. And that's why I say and I will emphasise our work does not end today. We have to build on this and build on it strongly. And very good news has come through. 46 British MPs have just signed a letter condemning the Modi government and calling on the United Nations Security Council to immediately debate this issue. Now, I know sometimes we get frustrated with the United Nations, but that is a good move. It's a very good move, and I, it's something that I think we need to put pressure on our, our parliament, our government, to add their voice to getting the Modi government to ensure that at starting point the communications are restored. I did also want to say something about Modi himself. I think when we speak about him, we need to get it across to people that this man has the most shocking track record. Many of you would know more than I do, but I've read about like Kutchmar. Shame, Modi, shame, absolutely. 2002, like it was premedicated violence. More than 2,000 people died is what so many of the reports have found. And that was where his hands are all over that and so many of the ministries he works with. And now what we see is what is going on in India and in the past few days, the latest step into turning in India from a secular country into fundamental Hindu with all the dangers that's involved with the authoritarian centralisation. And then we hear from Modi to try and make out the Kashmir issue is just an internal issue. And what he's doing will be good for Kashmir because it's good for economy. Absolute lies, 
that no. we need to expose at every turn. It's obviously not an internal issue. As you know so well, this is the most militarised area on the face of the earth. And we have two nuclear powers involved. Shame. Again, shame. a reminder, shame. Absolute shame. Shame. an absolute reminder of why all countries, and let's remember Australia, we're on the east coast, but we have a west coast that is a neighbour to this region. We have to have, our government should have a strong voice. Again, calling on the Modi government to back off and to start working for peace and justice for this region. That must be our priority. Another very worrying aspect while we're talking about Modi is his relationship with Netanyahu. And this, this is something that is very much linked with the constitutional change that they force through. Because what it allows is that foreigners can buy land in, in Kashmir. And what is that all about? It's about changing the demographics of that region. We've already heard the reports that there has been Indian, um, retired Indian military being moved into Kashmir. And now they will be able to do that more readily. Very similar to the settler policy that Netanyahu has used to displace Palestinians. And then on top of that, there is also the links bringing in um, military, military equipment that has been tested on Palestinians. Netanyahu and the Modi relationship needs to be exposed because it's crimes against both those people and we can help each other by uniting on that. So where do we go for Australia? Australian government is silent on it. And under Morrison, you probably wouldn't expect much more. But still, we need to keep the pressure on. And it's worth remembering that Australia has a very interesting and close relationship with Kashmir in the past. In the 1950s, Australian military observers were part of the United Nations Military Observers Group. I think we held that position until the 1980s. And on top of that, in 1950, Sir Owen Nixon, a former Chief Justice of the High Court, was actually brought in by the United Nations Security Council as a United Nations key representative to organise the plebiscite. Now, as we know, the plebiscite failed, but my point in emphasising that is again to remind ourselves and all Australians we have had this close relationship with Kashmir that we should build on rather than ignore. What my hope is, is that we can be a voice for Kashmir that is global. We need a global voice for Kashmir. Many of you have asked me today and on other days, like, what do we do? I don't have an easy answer to that. But what history shows us is that when people are so deeply oppressed as they are in Kashmir now, you need international solidarity. We need to stand with people of Kashmir. And a very good example of how that can achieve good outcomes is South Africa. When I'm a little girl, I'm walking, well, a teenager, when I'm walking around here in protests in the 1970s about South Africa and to get rid of apartheid, you felt, I can remember feeling apartheid's going to go on forever. But in time, our voice became global. And in the end, people who had backed South African apartheid became a voice against it because it was realised it was so abhorrent. We've got a tough road ahead. We'll take up David Shoebridge's offer, I'm sure, and go and have a forum there. But we need to have, on the street protest, have the one-to-one -one conversations with our friends and colleagues and take the voice of Kashmir because at the moment the Kashmiri voice is robbed. And I do believe that we can build a strong movement. Yes, it'll be tough, but we can do it. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. Let's stand together and the immediate call, I believe, has to be restore the communications and then we move on to self-determination for Kashmiris. Thank you very much. Viva Kashmir! Viva 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 Viva